Welcome. This is Aisha. I um, am a data scientist working for a startup called Root.io. And today we'll be talking about effective vulnerability management. The last 15 years of my career has been focused on the intersection of cybersecurity and data science, AI, deep learning. And I have done a ton of reporting work uh, as it comes to stating uh, the container landscape, container uh, cloud native security, cybersecurity in general. And if I learned one thing about effective vulnerability management, it's this adage. When everything is important, nothing is. When it comes to effective decision making, it's all about prioritization. And it is not going to be breaking news here when I say this number of CVEs, the common vulnerability exposures, um, uh, exploits that we are finding out in the wild are doubling, tripling over time. In fact, I can actually fit in a, a curve here and tell you that I'm expecting to see about 50,000 new CVEs in NVD um, in 2025. I remember the days when we had just a couple vulnerabilities per week. Right now, we are talking about, by 2025, um, about 136 CVEs per day. And um, is this because we are writing worse code than before? Not necessarily. The way I think about this is mostly around better tools more people, and more code. Let's look into the more code piece really quickly here. 2023, end of 2023, we have 35 million versions of packages in the NPM ecosystem. And it is growing at a rate of 1 million, these are not just packages, but they are versions as well, uh, about 1 million versions of these packages in a month. And for every, I think there's that statistic, I, don't, I cannot remember specifically where I heard that, but there's that uh, basic statistic that says for every 1,000 lines of code, you're likely to incur about three CVEs. So just by the fact that you're getting more code into the, the software world, right, the CVEs might be increasing, are increasing. But that's just the first layer, that one step thinking. The next layer that I would like to add to this, since we were just speaking about the NPM ecosystem, I brought in an older study. I have newer studies for different ecosystems for that. But this is 2019, and I can assure you that the situation is worse today. Uh, researchers from Darmstadt University found out that a typical NPM package loads an average of 79 third-party packages from 39 different maintainers. That's a typical. If you look at the package reach of the top five packages, that's between 134,000 and 166,000. So those are the top five you introduce one of these packages into your system, and all of a sudden, the entire dependency tree is, uh, is inheriting the attack surface um, of, of, of these other packages. So more code. There are a lot of new uh, numbering authorities when it comes to CVEs. It's a great thing. The community uh, is collaborating, creating these new CVEs. Um, obviously, vendors have a, 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 an interest here. They want to find vulnerabilities in their own so software uh, faster, better than anyone else for obvious reasons. So that is increasing. There are a lot more security researchers. And this is just the beginning, right? Enter the era of recursive self-improvement. AI, reading, interpreting, creating its own code. Anyone who can prompt can produce code, uh, which, is, which makes security teams very happy in every organization. And AI agents are already generating code 
uh, with recursive self-improvement, hopefully less with less vulnerabilities over time. But you can also think about this from the other perspective, that um, AI agents are already being used by the malicious actors, the bad actors, to create more malicious code, weaponizing AI. But again, a lot of security researchers are, uh, are, that I know are already using AI um, to find a needle in the haystack faster too. All in all, the CVEs are raining from the sky. But I do think that you might have these beautiful dashboards with all these CVEs as a DevSecOps operation, um, a, a, a DevSecOps department. But finding the CVEs in your software is not a big deal. It's cheap. But understanding if you're truly impacted, analyzing that, that I think is the expensive part. So let's take a step back. If in my town, and I know that in vulnerability management and software supply chain, the food analogies uh, are abundantly used, but let's say that in my town, my neighbors are dying left and right, they're being hospitalized, there's a crisis going on. What are the existential questions that I would ask myself, right? The first one is, what's going on? Very basic. If I can understand relatively quickly that it's from eggs, it's a salmonella outbreak, the next steps are also like, you know, pretty, pretty clear, right? Um, so it is not Listeria, it's not E. coli, it's salmonella. Did I deploy those eggs? Did I deploy those eggs into my system? Um, did I eat the eggs? Did the eggs that I ate come from a farm that's affected? Basically, were they vulnerable? And even if I ate the uh, eggs with the salmonella, what is the context here? Was there a specific temperature that you had to cook them? Are the people who are hospitalized certain age, do they have a specific type of immune system? Do they have pre-existing conditions? And if it is a check, check, check for all these boxes, what should I do, right? If I am owned, um, if I have been owned, what is the recovery, the incident response look like? So let's quickly think about the same thing from a vulnerability, the CVE perspective. A new CVE is, is, is published, it's announced. What is the first question that I'm asking to myself? Is my product at risk? The first thing is this concept of a software bill of materials, SPA, right? And it is not a static thing. I need to know, just like in my kitchen, I need to know a dynamic inventory of everything that I have in my maybe large scale of operations, all the microservices, all the software that I create, everything that goes into my application. For Google, this has been quite interesting. I just listened to them. I was a speaker at KubeCon, um, EU, uh, Europe, last month, and there was a presentation from Google. They talked about how they created 100,000 SPAMs in response to Biden's executive order, and it was a fun one. Like How they created that is one thing, how they operationalized that is another, and we can briefly talk about that. But so what is impacted as it comes to your product, your application, requires an understanding of your dynamic inventory the build in test tools versus production, because if it is in production, that's a whole different story. The next thing is, assuming that you have a full SBAM view, not just your own creation of the code, but also that supply chain that you have, all the vendors that you have deployed pieces, modules from, right? What is the next question? Can I knowing that like in an SPAM, all these components, can I map it to CVEs? And it is not just a number, a CVE ID that I'm talking about, but looking into the scores of these CVEs, all the metadata, doing a uh, reachability analysis, which I will be talking about as a BOV, Bill of Vulnerabilities. And even then, 
right? We are still in this risk analysis mode. I have the full picture. I have tied to this, that, that to the CVE. Now, what is the question that I'm asking to myself? What is the compensating controls in my case? Like, do I have a certain firewall? Um, do I have a, you know, a specific um, way of downloading the code in my system that doesn't necessarily make me vulnerable? And if all of these are yes for my product, what do I do next? And all of that I'll be talking about in the context of a VEX statement, which I think is a novel new thing that everybody should be hearing about. But let's, you know, again, take a step back and talk about each of these in, in a bit detail. So SBOM, as I said, is all about what's in my infrastructure. And in order to know uh, what's going on, I need that dynamic inventory view. It is um, usually about the first party and the third party, party components. And ideally, there are a lot of different types of um, standard, standards as has come to uh, SPAM. Ideally, it has all the direct and transitive components and the dependency relationships between them. I know it sounds pretty simple, but I was just talking about Google's case. They had to create SPAMs for their entire product line. In their case, 100,000 SPAMs, right? Um, yesterday, I was reading this uh, study uh, on uh, the, the state of SPAMs. Um, and they were talking about how they analyzed 83 open source SPAM tools with a perspective on how potential SPAM users select those tools. So even that, just selecting which tools, and Google talked about their case. I, uh, I um, listened to NVIDIA at the vulnerability conference, how they created their own flow. That's a fun story. So you select those different tools, you uh, decide on a flow, and you're generating all these components. So in an SPAM, you have the libraries, special permissions, licenses, packages, and it, you know, with packages, obviously, you have the the package URL, Perl, the version, um, all, all of the fun that gets into it. So standalone, nobody, I can say, that with a medium to large operation has the full picture as it comes to SBOM. But there are good things out there, like dependency tracker. It's actually, um, I believe last week, OWASP, the um, application security team, they uh, published this authoritative guide to SPAM, 75 page fun read. And what, I, what they create with Cyclone DX, if you're familiar with that, and dependency track, I think those are really great standards. But as you can tell, even that first step for a software uh, producer or a consumer is not easy. But let's assume that we get that part checked. Let's focus on the next question. Right? Am I at risk? So here, you want to get your SPAM, that bill of materials, and tie it to the vulnerability information. Right? Your SPAM is relatively st static. You would expect that to be static until such time your inventory changes. But the vulnerability information is constantly changing. We just talk about new CVEs popping up. And I said, I'm expecting 136 vulnerability CVEs being published every day in 2025, given the trends. So it's, again, it's a very dynamic world. So new vulnerability alert, a new CVE comes. What do we do? We need to dynamically map all the components that are in your system to these CVEs. And it is not just about your ID. You need to, the source of vulnerability intelligence. You want to know which organization or individual is credited with the discovery of this. You want to know multiple scoring systems about the CVE, right? Most notable ones are CVSS, EPSS, KEV, CISAS KEV. I brought in the definitions here. You may or may not be familiar, but those are in my mind just tools. They are these scoring systems. CVSS is 0 to 10, 9, 10, 7, 9, 10, you know, high critical 
uh, vulnerabilities. The way that they look at this is not looking at the explo exploitation, but they're looking at the severity of the CVE. EPSS is another model. They have an exploitation uh, mindset, and they look at the probability that a software vulnerability will be exploited in the wild within 30 days. They have these machine learning models, and these models constantly look into the ecosystem and update. So this is dynamic information. And the known exploited vulnerabilities, this is a very small set of CVEs. So for context, the National um, uh, Vulnerability Database, NVD, has, it's approaching 250,000 vulnerabilities. Kev is much, much smaller, you know, in the context, in, in, in the scale of 100, 200. CVEs. Those are known exploits. Now, using the CVE data, right, these different scores, you would think that you can choose one of them or maybe a couple and they will be in line with each other. But I brought in a couple of Patrick Garrity visualizations. He's, uh, he does really great uh, visualizations in the vulnerability management world. This is looking into all the CVEs in NVD, different scores. So the, the green one at the bottom are those ones that have a score between 0 to 4.9 and how that ties to the exploit, the EPSS model. And you can see that some of those low score vulnerabilities have a very high likelihood of, likelihood of exploitation. And some of the highest scores have a very um, low level of exploitation. So they are not uh, side by side, very meaningful, uh, or, or maybe they can get confusing, I must say. Same thing applies to Kev as well. CISAS Kev versus uh, CVSS base score versus the EPSS probabilities. You need to really understand them all to really to, you know, make, make that um, data, that intelligence meaningful in your context. But in this BOV case, the, the bill of vulnerabilities in your ecosystem, CVEs never tell the whole story because not everything that's vulnerable is affected by that vulnerability. What I mean with that is, you know, I'm going to explain that with a specific example in a bit, but then also the number of CVEs in these large scale operations, the security uh, researchers working with in, a, in an organization, it is overwhelming. There's just so much that even if there is something meaningful in that data, it is really hard to surface that out. So let's start with that first part. Not everything that's vulnerable is actually um, is affecting your software thing. So let's take that as the CVE. You found out it popped up in your DevSecOps dashboard. It has a pretty large CVSS score. I believe it's 7.5. And you go in. You do your research, you go into multiple blog posts, you uh, read through uh, GitHub advisories and whatnot, and then you realize that for your specific instance, it's, it's not even a, a, an issue, it's actually a resolved thing, which is great. But this one security researcher did that probably for a specific part of the product, let's say that in a large company, but that information is just like, you know, for that researcher, for that particular company, that product, and there's no transfer of learnings. They, they, they say, okay, this is not necessarily affecting me, good to go. How often does this happen? This is a resource, this is a um, survey that I did with Enterprise Strategy Group, asking questions to um, medium large companies, um, security and uh, infosec and, and uh, security leaders. And I asked this question around, how often organizations detect these CVEs, vulnerabilities in cloud-native containerized workloads in production. So this is not test and uh, build environments. This is specifically production. And I wasn't expecting this. As I said, I have created all these surveys and uh, studies multiple times. I, I'm very aware of like false positive dates, uh, rates and whatnot. But I wasn't expecting that one in three organizations seeing these vulnerabilities, high critical vulnerabilities in their production systems on a daily basis. So actually 14% said 
they see these critical vulnerabilities multiple days, uh, multiple times a day, which means that you have to stop doing everything and patch that or mitigate that risk right away. And again, false positive rates, these alerts and more alerts that happen in your system all the time. And there's a huge number of false positives in this information. Just like we talked about that, that CVE in a moment ago, you do your research, you realize that it doesn't affect you. It's a false positive. You move on to the next day where you will be actually looking into a new critical vulnerability in your production environment. So it's very overwhelming. But let's say that that's good. You, you still have that component to CVE mapping. The last question here for organizations, I think this is critical. And it's critical for the code that you generated. And it is even more critical for the code that you deploy from other vendors. And that question is this, am I affected by this vulnerability one? And if yes, what do I do about that vulnerability? Just like in the Salmonella case, it's all about context, your firewall, right? The right decision intel to understand the, com the, the compensating controls in your environment to say, yes, you know, this is something that I need to do something about. Which brings me to that SPAM we talked about, plus BOV, the Bill of Materials, plus VEX. I think, again, this, the VEX piece here is the newest and the most important piece. And I left there a, a quick description about VEX. Right? It, it gives you the status of specific vulnerabilities in a particular product. It's very specific. For me, it is context. So you see a CVE. You see its status. The, your vendor or your team says, this is uh, known affected, uh, known not affected. This is an under investigation CVE. You also have the information on how to resolve that vulnerability. There's a mitigation and patching path. So let's talk about a quick workflow when you have all of this, right? So your deployed application has a full SBOM, 100,000 SBOMs, and its dependencies, third parties, everything is in one place. A new CVE comes in, it's published, and you, you realize that it is in your application's dependency tree. Obviously, that makes that CVE push being pushed into your DevSecOps dashboard. What does your um, team do? In the case of a Novex environment, either you're just like, no, it's, it's a zero or one, I need to do a force upgrade right away, which might break your systems, or you start running a full investigation. Now, every consumer, if this is a vendor's uh, module that they deployed in their environment, right, does this as a one-off. So I do my own research, I have scanned my environment, I saw this CVE, now I'm doing my own research, and the other consumers are probably doing the same. And uh, with VEX, it's a whole different flow. You, have, you can make the, the informed decision uh, on what to make, what to do uh, next, right? Now, the thing that is the most complex in this full picture is this same workflow for your software supply chain. The dynamics between the producers, the software producers and consumers. And the same survey that I talked about, the ESG survey, we asked questions to uh, software uh, companies, technology companies. We said, do you see yourself as a software producer or a consumer? Almost everyone put themselves into one of these categories. Nobody said I'm not a producer or a consumer. So everybody, in this day and age is either consuming software from others or producing software for uh, consumers. So for the last three years, I mentioned that I focused on cybersecurity research. Um, this last three years, I've been focusing on cloud native workloads and containers specifically. And uh, one thing that comes up is this this idea of trading libraries, packages, containers, and sharing risk between these pairs, the software consumers and vendors. The second graph here is talking about how many software producers a typical organization deploy containers from in a typical month, right? 
So 73% of the organizations that we asked this question to said they work with 10 plus software producers deploying containers in their environment on a typical month. So just in a typical month I work with, I get software from 10 different producers. As you can see, about 13% said we work with um, 50 plus. And this is hundreds of containers from each. What this does is it creates a huge network complexity, right? Getting containers, getting the software from these third party producers makes it extremely dif difficult to triage the vulnerabilities that we talked about. And it increases the software attack surface of your application. Then we try to understand how these payers are talking to each other, right? And if these learnings that they have is being transferred. And the majority said, 75% said, they use spreadsheets one-to-one, -one, ad hoc meetings, and they email tracking spreadsheets when they talk to their vendors. And think about this, like, you know, I'm a software producer, I have 200 customers, 2,000 customers. I send my um, application to them so that they can deploy it into their own environment. And for each and every one of them, there's a new CV comes up and I update my spreadsheet. It's unbelievably primitive and archaic, but that's the case um, right now. So in the survey, one thing that came up was that there was this strong call for a centralized collaboration platform dedicated to decision-making about the vulnerabilities. So everything that we talked about, right, and creating an SBOM, <laughs> creating a bill of vulnerabilities, then adding a VEX statement on top of it, how are we going to communicate? At the end of the day, this becomes, as a data scientist, um, this is hard for me to accept, but this becomes a behavioral issue. Between these different companies, there needs to be a, a, a consent, a, there needs to be a, a collaboration platform where all of this information is uh, trickled down the system. So at the end of the day, when I eat my egg, I need to, I don't have to have a food lab. My farmer should tell, me that they are affected and I need to take caution. So the core problem, although I have thrown a lot of numbers at you, in my eyes is a lack of trust and collaboration issue. Without the producers, the benevolent actors in our software supply chain, propagating the security findings in their own software to the consumers, I don't think anything we can work, can be, we can do, can be successful. Because right now, we talked about SBOMs and vulnerability reports. It boils down to asymmetric information, which results in delayed software de deployments and inefficiency. And we talked about the spreadsheet and how it must die. The absurdity of how producers and consumers are talking to each other it's non-scalable, non-optimum, it needs to change. And um, it is not just the producers. In the consumer's case, there's this movement around zero vulnerabilities, right? Consumers pushing producers for, uh, to give them zero effective vulnerabilities. Consumers, just like in the food industry, right? There's an inherent risk everybody accepts. So when I walk into my grocery shop, I know that there's some risk but it can be contained because there is enormous, remarkable visibility in the physical supply chain. So I can assume that my vendor is going to do their best when a big issue comes up, right? There are certain SLOs that they're going to come up with. So not, they're not telling me that they have zero critical vulnerabilities. Even if they tell, it, that, tell that to me right now, two minutes later, you know, things change. So they need to make sure that um, they give that information to you. They become transparent and consumers have that inherent risk acceptance and trust relationship. I think we all know what to do, but our tools, our systems, the things that we talked about, the SBOMs, the automation, the operationalization of those SBOMs, the bill of materials, the bill of vulnerabilities, and the VEX statements, uh, they, they, they um, have to change. But more importantly, we need to have a new paradigm as it comes to proactive vulnerability disclosure between these pairs that we talked about. So it's um, standardized formats 
and automation, secure and verifiable sharing between these pairs, continuous monitoring, and a communication and behavioral change between different parties. So at root, we are on a mission to help software consumers and producers, these pairs that we talked about, be more transparent and communicate effectively between each other. I know that there's a lot of action going on in the industry in terms of focusing on SBOMs, software supply chain security, and being more transparent. So right now, the complexity is huge. But I believe, especially if we can make this clearer in software producers' minds, because I have what I am seeing is that a lot of software producers are unwilling to share information about the software that they give. Although in you know, theory, it's a good thing. Um, there's not enough regulation. There's not enough um, push to have them give the full information about the bugs and CVEs that they have in their software. In fact, when I was at KubeCon last uh, month, several people came to me, they said, it's great that you're telling us that we need to have the SBOMs for our producers. We have been working with all these producers. 90% refuse to give their SBOMs to us. The rest is not fully um, you know, uh, giving everything to us. It's like it's uh, conflicted information. A lot of people don't even know that they have to do this. But with the NIST guidelines that they came up in fe February, I believe that that wave is also changing. So with that, thank you so much for your time. We don't have any time left for a Q&A session, unfortunately. But I'll be around. If you have any questions, please let me know. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And we can, I would love to um, answer the questions you might have and make the connections. So thank you.